Welcome to this podcast on an integrated scenario. This will involve a discussion about a particular scenario which will be discussed in the podcast and all the questions will be related to the hardware, software, internet and networking, data and information and solution development related and applied to this integrated scenario. These topics are from question 10 of the 2024 Computer Applications Technology November Paper 2 exam or theory exam. There are three ways that you can engage with the content of this podcast. If you want to test your knowledge, then download the questions covered in the video first. The link to the PDF is in the video description. Then go and attempt those questions. And finally, come back and listen to the podcast so that you can compare the discussion with your answers. If you want to use the podcast to learn new information, then first listen to the discussion, then download the questions, the PDF link in the video description mentioned earlier, and then test yourself to see how much you remember from the discussion. Or you can simply enjoy the discussion and learn more about how the different forms of computing can be applied to this integrated scenario. And now let's hear what our podcasters have to say about this particular scenario. Welcome to the deep dive. Today, we are immersing ourselves in, well, a pretty high stakes scenario a school running a massive triathlon. Yeah, swimming, biking, running sounds like pure physical effort. Right, but for the organizers, it's actually a huge computing challenge. We're looking at this whole TEP architecture, you know, handling registration, tracking everyone, safety, analyzing results for hundreds of people. And that's really our mission today. We're going to unpack how all that technology integrates start to finish, looking at the computer concepts behind making something like this actually work. So it's like a shortcut for you, the listener, to see how classroom ideas uh, manage a real fast moving event. Exactly. From theory to practice. OK, so before we jump into the details, we need to ground this whole thing. The sources start with a basic but crucial distinction, mm -hmm. data versus information. People use them interchangeably, but they're not the same, right? Not technically, no. It's yeah. kind of like potential versus reality. Data is just raw facts. Right. The number 42, maybe a timestamp like 1.30 p.m., a name, Jane Doe. Mm. It doesn't mean much on its own. Information, though, that's processed data. Data that now has meaning. So when you take Jane Doe's 42-minute swim time, put it next to the course record, maybe calculate her rank, yeah. suddenly that raw data tells you something useful. It becomes information. Got it. So this whole text setup is basically designed to turn raw data into useful information fast. Precisely. Rapidly and accurately. That's the game. All right. So that conversion, it starts with getting the data in, registration. The sources really push for electronic forms over paper. Now, OK, it's faster for athletes, better for the environment, sure. But why is this like a critical technical choice? Uh, the main technical reason, data integrity, honestly. Paper forms, you get errors, someone misreads handwriting, typos happen when someone keys it in, there are delays. Right. Electronic forms let you do data validation instantly, like the second the participant clicks submit. Okay, let's unpack data validation. That sounds important. What are we actually checking there to avoid messing up the database later? Yeah, it's key. You're usually checking uh, three main types of things. First, format checks. Like making sure a phone number looks like a phone number. Exactly. Or an email has an at symbol. Then second, range checks, making sure, say, that the athlete's age is within the allowed range for the race, maybe 15 to 18. Makes sense. And third, sometimes presence checks, just making sure essential fields like emergency contacts aren't left empty. So catching errors right away means the data going into the system is clean from the start? Clean, accurate, and ready to be processed, mm. which is vital when things are moving fast on race day. Okay, clean data acquired. Now getting the word out, posters are still a thing, apparently. But even posters connect to the digital world now. The sources mention online ads, social media, prints, radio, all that. But let's zoom in on the QR code on a poster. What's happening there? Ah, the QR code. It's basically a physical link to the digital world. Yeah. You scan that square pattern with your phone, yep. and the phone reads the web address, the URL hidden inside it. Instantly, it opens a link. No typing needed. So it takes you straight to the race website or the registration form. Could be either, yeah. yeah. Or maybe a map of the route. It just bridges that gap between seeing the poster and getting the info online. Turns looking into clicking, essentially. Cool. Okay, speaking of online, this event is raising money for charity. So if you want to tap into a big online crowd, you know, get small donations from lots of people, there's a specific term for that method, right? There is. We're talking about crowdfunding. And for a charity event like this, 
Choosing the right platform matters. How so? Aren't they all the same? Not quite. Some, like Kickstarter, are often about funding a product, you know, with rewards. Mm. But for straight-up charity fundraising, platforms like GoFundMe or maybe Kiva, Backabuddy, Indiegogo, mm. they might be a better fit. Why? Their structure is often more geared towards donations for a cause, social impact. The focus is just raising the money, not pre-selling something. So the platform choice affects things like fees and who you reach. All right, let's fast forward to race day. Tech focus shifts now from admin to capturing what's happening in real time, digital cameras out on the course. Now, everyone thinks megapixels first, but the sources list a whole bunch of other specs. So beyond just resolution, what really makes for a good, reliable event photo? Oh, yeah. Megapixels are just one piece of the puzzle. Yeah. You need the whole system working together. Think of it in like two parts. First, the actual hardware. Okay. That means really good quality lenses, obviously. And super important, a large, high quality sensor. The sensor's size and type directly impacts how much light and detail it can actually grab. And the second part, the settings. Exactly. The operational settings and software side. Yeah. Things like color depth and contrast ratio, they affect how rich the image data is. Then there's the ISO rating. For low light, like an early morning start. Precisely. Controls light sensitivity. Yeah. And for a race with fast action, you absolutely need good image stabilization to avoid shaky shots and a fast shutter speed to freeze the most, you know, present blur. Mm. It's this whole combination, even the camera's built in software and filters, that gives you that final usable shot. It's complex. So you get these amazing, probably huge image files. How do you get them off the camera and onto a laptop quickly for sorting and sharing? The sources say use a card reader, not plugging the camera straight in. Why is that better in a hectic race situation? It really comes down to keeping things moving efficiently. First, card readers are generally faster for transferring data. Huge plus when you've got potentially thousands of photos coming in. Okay, speed. What else? Second, big one, logistically it saves the camera's battery. The camera doesn't have to power the transfer itself. Ah, good point. But maybe the most critical advantage, independence. Yeah. You can pull the memory card out and transfer the photos without the camera needing to be there. Oh, so the photographer can stick the card with someone else and get back out there. Exactly. The camera goes back on the course immediately while a separate team processes the photos from the card. It allows you to work in parallel. Much smoother workflow. Makes sense. Okay, let's track the athletes now. They often wear these little RFI tags for timing and safety. First, thinking about the whole course. It's spread out. What kinds of networks are probably involved in connecting everything? Good question. Since it's spread out, you need flexibility. You definitely have WLAN's wireless local area networks for high-speed connections at specific points, like checkpoints or the finish line. Right, Wi-Fi, basically. Yeah. If the whole school campus network covers the area, that might be part of a larger LAN, a local area network. But if the race goes out onto public roads or across a big park, yeah, then you might even need to use a WAN, a wide area network, to link those distant checkpoints back to the main hub maybe using cellular data or other long-range tech. Gotcha. And those RFID tags themselves, radio frequency identification, how are they sending their info to the readers at those checkpoints? What's the tech? They use radio waves. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. These tags have a tiny chip and antenna. They can be passive, meaning they get power from the reader's signal when they get close, or active, with a small battery. When the tag passes near a reader antenna, the reader sends out a signal, the tag responds by transmitting its unique ID number using these radio frequency signals. And this happens like instantly. Pretty much instantaneous. Yeah. So what are the concrete benefits? Why bother tagging every single athlete? Well, there are three really critical reasons. First, tracking progress and safety. You know where each participant is roughly in real time. Super important for safety, especially during the swim or on the bike course. Okay, safety first. Second, timing. It gives you an immediate, accurate timestamp when they hit a checkpoint or the finish line. No human stopwatch errors. Right. And third, ranking. Because you have the times instantly, you can calculate their position, their rank right away for announcers, for online results, everything. Very cool. And speaking of cool tech, for filming the leaders, the sources mention autonomous cars, self-driving cars filming the race. Define that for us in this context. Yeah, an autonomous car here is basically a self-driving vehicle. It uses a whole suite of sensors, LiDAR, radar, advanced cameras, to see its surroundings, predict what's happening, and drive itself safely with minimal or even zero human input. And the advantage for filming. Precision, really. 
Wow. They can maintain a perfectly steady speed and distance from the lead athlete, much better than a human driver might, especially over a long race. That means smoother, higher quality footage without worrying about driver fatigue or, you know, jerky movements. Okay, that's some serious race day tech. Let's swing back to the nerve center, the control room where the organizers are glued to screens for hours. We need to think about their well-being too. Ergonomics comes up. People under pressure might just grab any chair, skip breaks. What does ergonomic design actually mean and why does it matter for like data quality? Ergonomics is all about designing the workspace, the furniture, the computer setup, everything to make working more comfortable and crucially safer. It's about fitting the job to the person, not the other way around, to reduce strain and fatigue. And why does that matter for data? Because if the person monitoring the screens is tired, uncomfortable, has a sore neck, they're way more likely to make mistakes miss a critical alert from a safety sensor, maybe misinterpret some timing data, fatigue leads to errors, and errors can corrupt your data or lead to bad decisions. Okay, so good chairs and monitor setups help. But beyond the gear, what practical things can the organizers actually do during long shifts to avoid strain, according to the sources? It's mostly about conscious habits. Yeah. Number one, take regular breaks. Yeah. And not just scrolling on your phone, actually get up, move around, look away from the screen. Right. Step away. Second, posture. Sounds basic, but sit up straight, use the chair's back support, keep both feet flat on the floor. Avoid slouching or craning your neck down at the screen. Yeah. Easier said than done sometimes. Totally. And third, specifically for eye strain, look away from the screen every, say, 15 minutes. Focus on something far away for a few seconds. These little things add up to reduce fatigue and keep concentration levels higher. Good advice. Okay, race finished. All that data times splits, floods into a spreadsheet for the final analysis. Making sense of all those numbers quickly is key. What's a powerful visual tool in spreadsheets for this? How does it help? The big one here is conditional formatting. It's fantastic because it lets you see patterns and outliers in the data instantly visually without needing complex formulas. How does it work? Like highlighting cells. Exactly. You set up rules. For example, automatically highlight any finish times over a certain limit in red or highlight the top 10 finishers in green. Okay. Highlighting. Any other visual tricks? Oh yeah. You can use top or bottom rules to quickly flag the fastest or slowest times. You can put data bars right inside the cells like little horizontal bar charts showing how big a number is relative to others. Ah, I've seen those. Or use color scales, maybe green for fast times, fading to red for slow times. And icon sets, like little arrows, showing if someone improved their position between checkpoints. It turns a wall of numbers into something you can actually understand at a glance. That sounds incredibly useful for quickly identifying winners or issues. Now, two specific spreadsheet functions for admin tasks. Let's say organizers need to create a unique ID code for each participant, maybe their name plus some random numbers. Which two functions do they need? For that specific task, you'd combine two functions. First, concatenate. That's the function that joins text strings together. <laughs> So it joins the name. With the numbers. Right. And to generate those random numbers, you'd use rand between. You tell the lowest and highest number you want, and it spits out a random integer in that range. Put them together, you get name, one, two, three, four, five. Automates unique ID creation. Prevents manual errors too, I bet. Okay, last step. The final cleaned up spreadsheet data needs to go into a proper database for long-term storage. There's a way to do this without even opening the database program. What's that feature called and why use it instead of just copy-paste? That feature is export. And you use it because database is a structure. Copy-pasting can mess up that structure, maybe paste numbers as text, lose formatting. Mm -hmm. It's risky for data integrity. So export is safer. Much safer. The export function in the spreadsheet program packages the data correctly, often into a standard format like a CSV file or XML. It preserves the structure and data types. The database can then import this file cleanly, knowing the data is already validated and formatted correctly. It ensures a smooth, accurate migration. Wow. Okay. That really covers the whole life cycle. We started with just the idea of a school race and broke down how computing touches everything from signups with data validation. To using radio waves with RFID for tracking. To using visual tools like conditional formatting and spreadsheets to make sense of it all at the end. And it all comes back to that initial idea, right? turning raw data movement, time, locations into meaningful information, rankings, safety checks, official results. That whole journey was powered by the tech integration we discussed. It really shows how all these different concepts have to work together seamlessly. It definitely took careful planning to pull off that triathlon tech. So here's something for you to think about. Imagine planning next year's event. 
Maybe it's bigger, international. What completely new piece of tech might you need? Perhaps a dedicated sensor network tracking air quality or heat stress on the course. Ooh, interesting. And if you added that, think about the data validation needed before anyone even starts racing. Mm. Maybe cross-referencing sensor readings with official weather service data, what checks would be absolutely non-negotiable, especially mm. thinking about safety and liability. Definitely something to mull over. Join us next time for another deep dive. It would mean the world to us if you could support the channel by please clicking on that subscribe button and sharing us with other people so that we can help others that want to learn about computer terms so that they don't have to do it the long way, but they can do it the Mr. Long Way.